Write the world-changing book that will help grow your personal brand and your business as it makes the world a better place. Welcome to the Author's Corner, hosted by Robin Colucci. Every episode, we bring you some of the most successful authors, as well as other industry experts, to share some inspiration, motivation, tactical strategy, and fun. We'll also talk about the challenges and trends in the publishing industry. Don't get stuck in the idea phase. Join the Author's Corner today. Start writing the book you've dreamed about. Hi, I'm Robin Colucci, and welcome to the Author's Corner. Today, I have with us our special guest, Edie Rather. And Edie is a renowned keynote speaker, best-selling author, parenting coach, and occupational therapist. She's a leading authority on the neuroscience of achievement and brain-based performance, including emotional and intuitive intelligence. Edie is an effervescent dynamo with unwavering passion to educate and enlighten others so they can step into their greatest potential. She has empowered over 3,500 professional associations, Fortune 500 companies, educational organizations, and community and youth groups across five continents. Her training programs include Integrate Action, Intelligence, for high impact results. And she's turned around some of New York City's most at risk kids. She's hosted talk shows on radio and TV with ABC affiliates and continues to thrive as a social change agent. And what Edie and I uh, talked about quite a bit today was her extraordinary journey, uh, being the author of multiple books on multiple uh, subjects. And Edie is really open and transparent with us in sharing about some of the different kinds of challenges that she's faced and how she's dealt with them. And this is a really valuable episode for anyone who's just entering the uh, foray of, or entering the fray, I should say, of approaching authorship. And also potentially for uh, even the more seasoned author who maybe has not necessarily yet experienced some of the uh, variety of things that Edie has. And so I encourage you to listen and uh, see if you can glean some insights that would apply to you in your own journey. Welcome to the Author's Corner. It's such a delight to have you today. It's a bigger delight for me to be here, Robin. I'm so much looking forward to this conversation because when we chatted before, as we were talking about doing this interview, one of the things that I discovered in our initial conversation was that you've written so many books and you have had so many adventures in the, the process of uh, this, this long career as a speaker and author. So, um, Tell us a little bit about your first book and um, how that came about for, for you. And, you know, what was that thing that flipped that switch in your mind that said, now's the time for me to write this book, for, for me to write my first book? And, and that's a good question, Robin, because I had wanted to write for over 25 years before I started writing. Once I started writing, I honestly got addicted. I couldn't stop. I wrote seven books in less than seven years. And, and, and it was almost an obsession. I, I no, it was more of an addiction and, <laughs> and, and I loved it. And, and it, it was a healthy addiction, which got <laughs> marked, you know, but it was interesting because I had always wanted to write. I will tell you the truth. Every morning I looked in the mirror and I was getting so fed up with myself mm. for not doing what I felt my calling in life was. And, and this is something for everybody to learn because um, I'm a professional speaker, National Speakers Association, CSP, all of that stuff for years. And we were always told that speakers really should have a book because it adds to their credibility. And I would agree with that. But, you know, one of the things was that I would go to all the programs at NNSA because it wasn't always speaking. It was a lot of authorship. And, and they would say, you know, get up at four in the morning and every day write for three hours or do this or that. And, and you know what? You have got to find your own way and what works for you because I am, 
I'm a momentum person. And to just say, okay, it's three o'clock today. I'm going to write from three to four. That's not how my creative juices work. Mm -hmm. I am somebody, when I started writing, I wrote around the clock. I forgot to get dressed. I'd forget to take a shower. I became absorbed. Do you know what I mean? Oh, I do. I do. Yeah. yeah. And so don't listen to people who say, this is the magic formula. That's what worked for them. And so mm -hmm. there's nothing I can emphasize more then know who you are and what will work for you and what finally worked because I'm very right brain, which most ADD people are. <laughs> and, and so what I did is I took my little 19 foot boat, went to the ocean where I would have no distractions. There's, you know what I mean? And at 11 o'clock mm -hmm. at night, I would check my voicemail. That was it. And I forgot the plug. So I never even put the boat in the water. It was in a parking lot. I stayed at <laughs> Villa Capriani, this gorgeous hotel, um, condos, whatever. In the parking lot? <laughs> I, well, I would go to the beach and there was a place where they had weddings. And so there were uh, outlets out on the oh, patio. Right. <laughs> so I had this little arch. So even when it was raining, I could still keep writing. And I started telling too many people on the fifth day, they came to me and kicked me out because I wasn't paying. Yeah, I would go to right. my boat to sleep. <laughs> But you know what, Robin, it worked. It, it, it broke the writer's block mm -hmm. and just having it. So, you know, people talk about time management. I'm also about space management, environment management. Going to that space gave me the freedom to focus and to move forward. Now, now I could write right here. I, I could do it, but, but to break it. So I'm just advising to people, find your own way. That is what worked for me. And because for me, it takes, it may take a couple of days just to get into the zone, mm -hmm. into the flow. And then I'm, I'm like a vessel. It all comes to me, which brings me to another point. And I know that Clinton apparently did the same thing. Um, uh, the ex-president Clinton. Oh, I was going to say, Bill or Hillary? Okay. Yeah, it wasn't Hillary. It was <laughs> and apparently he did the same thing. He wrote his books on a yellow canary pad and not on a computer. And I did find that, that at first um, I had to write and I, I do brain training. I do hypnosis and brain training as a psychotherapist. And it is true that when you write, you actually activate a different part of your brain and it tends to be where the creative juices are hanging out. Mm. And now I would have to say, I can get on the computer and do it as well. I think it's almost like we retrain our brain. Yeah. So there again, know what works for you, the mm. time, the place, the method, the approach, all of that I think has to be very individual. And yeah, there's one I of the... Okay, yeah. go ahead. No, no, you say it because I'll know. Throw in here because I, I really think that what you're saying, you know, because it's so true. People say, well, just write two hours every morning or write an hour every morning. And what you're talking about is really accurate. Like I'm, I'm similar to you in that I will be working on a piece of writing. Like when I was writing my book, I'd be thinking about it for six days, like so thinking about the next chapter for six days. And then I'd sit mm -hmm. down and write that chapter in one. Yeah. You know? And, and, but there was so much going on in that percolating. Um, exactly. Thing I'm just kind of like store up energy and then yes. <laughs> shoot it out. Right. So that's my way. And your way was to just sit down. I, I'm curious, how, how long did it take you to write your first book? <laughs> you know, once you actually sat down to start writing? I, you know, that's a very good question. I don't think real long. Because yeah, I couldn't stop. I, I, I couldn't stop. It was like I'd forget to eat. You know, it's like, oh my God, I have these clothes on for three weeks. I think <laughs> um, and I know when it was because when 9 11 occurred, I was sitting out on the patio of Villa Capriani and somebody said, oh, you know, the Twin Towers uh, were hit. And I so I remember running in. So what was that, 2001? Was that yeah, 2001? 2000. Yeah, because it was 20 years this year. Mm -hmm. And, um, and uh, but I think, you know, within the year, and, you know, there's an excitement. There's kind of, you know, they always say you have more pictures of the firstborn child than the other seven combined. Right. There's some truth to that. 
<laughs> I was so excited, you know, when the first book came. This is no lie. I, I was flying out for a speaking engagement. Robin, I sold 42 books before I got on the plane. I, I got lost going to the airport. I stopped traffic in the middle of the road to get directions. I sold everybody a book. And so, you know, there's something to be said about that excitement and enthusiasm. So I'm at the airport and I'm just, I, I mean, it was like a book signing at the airport. And then I noticed with my other books, they would come and I'd get 10,000 at a time. And, and I didn't even open up. And so I sold so many more of the first because, you know, and, and that's another thing for people to know. I remember being told that one third of book sales is the title, one third is the cover, one third is the actual content. I really believe that. First book is Why Cats Don't Bark. That's a killer title. That's a killer title, I know it is. And the funny thing is, I think most people think of, oh, I'm gonna write this book. It's like, I'm gonna have a baby, let's look for a name. And so we're gonna write a book and let's get a good title. I was at, I'm not gonna say her name, um, but I looked her up, she just retired. I was at a workshop and it was one of those things you paid for, so you're gonna stick it out, but I was bored to tears. Right. <laughs> I can't handle boredom, Rodman. And I was sitting there putting together the book to keep myself from getting bored. Right. And what came to mind was Why Cats Don't Bark. The funny thing is I came up with the title and I thought, it's good, that yeah. is good. And then I decided, what would fit the title? <laughs> that's, that's a way to do it. That's absolutely yes. a way to do it. You know, I want to add something to what you said, though, because what I didn't hear in those three parts about the title and the content and what was the, the cover, which I believe are all are true. But what, what I didn't hear was the author hustle. And you clearly understand that. <laughs> If you can sell 43 copies in the airport before you get on the plane. Isn't that crazy? I know. And you know what? I trust people so much. I lost everything. I did very well as a therapist, a speaker, lost millions and literally went to zero. And it was just interesting that the motivation then, then the motivation went to um, I'm doing it because every time I sell a book, it's going to help pay the electric bill, <laughs> you know? Wow. So I think, you know, complacency can set in that if, if you're not that committed, you don't have the drive. I was just li listening to Steve Harrison's oh, sure. program on marketing and, and, you know, he gave the example of rich dad, poor dad, Kawasaki, who apparently is still the number one seller for financial books. And, you know, it, it, he made an interesting point. It was, I'm not, I, he, his, his goal wasn't to write a book. It was to write a bestseller. He was all about the money. I think the, huh. the mistake a lot of authors make, Robin, is, oh, they have a message. And, and I'm that way too. And, and they want to share it with the world. And, you know, if that artistic part of us, it can become a stumbling block. Because if you're really going to write it, unless you're just going to give it away for Christmas presents, you have to have the commitment to the marketing plan before you even pick up the pen. Absolutely. Well, I have an agent friend who I thought put it so well. She says, yeah, but she goes, if no one reads your book, did you really write a book? Exactly. And you know how Jack Canfield said it? And, and that was just in this program too, yeah, yeah. is that to write a book and then not market it, is like having a baby and leaving it on somebody's doorstep. Yeah. And that, that does, says it all. It does not, like, not you want to have impact. It, yeah, it's having a baby, not feeding it and wondering why it's not thriving. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's like. <laughs> exactly. And, and I will say, and I'm sure you know this, Robin, writing the book is fun. Editing right. is absolute hell. <laughs> it is. And we'll talk about that in a minute. And then marketing it, is a lot of work yeah and, and you really need to have that last step or you know it's a christmas gift mm -hmm. but can i just say something about what was the second step i said second step was editing mm. um i want to just say one thing about it and and you know what everybody's got to find their own way but i do know grammar fairly well my son knows it better 
And I remember him fighting with the editor and it always felt like my son was right. And so I, I, I've never found a good editor. So if you have, let me know who it is because I want to write one more. But um, Honey, I've got a team of great editors. What oh, do you? Do you <laughs> So now you show up. Now she comes inside. <laughs> and now you have to write seven more. Yeah, I guess so. But I'll tell you what, I would have more, um, you know, have your fingers in the pot because I was telling you that I was going to my book. I was speaking for Unity Church. It's the first book, Why Cats Don't Park, is on your soul's code and calling in life intuition. And, and so it was something I was talking about at Unity. So I thought, oh, I'll go to my book and you know, I'll have my outline there. And the soul's code part, I couldn't find it. And who edited my book took out what in my heart and mind was the core of the book. And that book is only 128 pages. They're pretty much all sold out, 10,000. And, and so I will add to it. So I'm just saying I'm not against editors. But you got to realize that some will write their book, not yours. And maybe that's okay with you. Maybe you don't have an idea what you really no, want to write about, but editor, I do. An editor who takes something that important out of the book without consulting the author is, you know, that's that's not okay. I, I really yeah. think that editing needs to be a collaborative process where right. the, the, the primary goal is helping the author to express themselves in a way that the reader can receive it. Right. You know, and and right. that's, but but that doesn't mean that you don't get to share your right biggest ideas. I mean, that's, that's. Uh, so it's probably especially with a book that short, my goodness. Yeah. You yeah. had plenty of room. <laughs> I don't I know. <laughs> and fortunately that one is sold the best. That is the best. Well, that's another thing we should talk about. Mm. Um, I, my books are, I don't remember how many foreign rights I sold, but I know it's over a dozen, which is great for self-publishers. Yeah. And um, uh, and it's a bestseller in China. And I think I told you. Oh, I, I want to, <laughs> but I want to hear it as if you never said a word because this is, get ready, listeners. This is a story. This is a, a, a this a, is good. A cautionary tale. Yeah, and, and you know, a crime really doesn't pay. It'll surface. So anyway, while I'm doing my children ch children's book, um, which is part of a complete system and, and did a TEDx talk to market it, and that's the thing we can talk about with marketing too. But anyway, I'm talking to Sam in China because when you do a children's book, nobody here even bids on the printing. They can't compete. Yeah, the color. And, just, yeah, and so I said to Sam, oh my God. I just remember it. I got, you know, why cats don't bark is in Chinese. You should get it. And this is like 10 years after it came out. And he said, oh my God, you wrote that book. And he was like, it's all over. Like chicken soup for the soul would be here or all over. And, and I said, yeah, but it was 10 years ago. And they said it bombed. I was told it bombed. They gave me the money up front. They gave, they give you the upfront, you know, kind of thing. And then, and then some <laughs> royalties. Well, anyway, and I said, no, 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 they said it bombed and they never did a second run. And he said, no, I, I, I see it, it's all over. He shows me the new cover, which means there's more than the first run. Right. And it says right on the front cover, bestseller, uh, 220,000 or million or whatever copies sold. And so I still remember her name, Nancy Tan, you know, um, she's denying it. It's, and then I, I remember this, Robin, I said, wait a minute, here's the cover. You told the people of China that it sold this many copies and it's a bestseller. And she said, oh, we just did that for marketing. And so then I said, wait a minute. So you're telling me you just lied to all the Chinese people. Many are over there, but you're <laughs> telling me I should trust you that you're not lying to me. You're not, <laughs> you're one not of us. lying to me, right? Yes. And so, but, but authors who have had rights sold in China almost know. They don't believe in paying for intellectual property. It looks good on your resume, but you have to really stay on it. Mm -hmm. So anyway, it's kind of an interesting story, but um, yeah, it's part of the process. Yeah. And I think, I, I wonder if it's, you know, I haven't talked with agents about this, but I'm, I'm wondering if it's a little easier dealing with that kind of foreign, foreign rights issue when you have a, a literary agent representing you. 
or if everybody just gets screwed i don't know now i did have an agent oh, okay. and i liked him he, i mean he's the reason i got into so many countries mm -hmm. and and mcmillan in india so he did a good job yeah but he didn't support me in this i'm sure because there was future business with her mm. and i was a done deal so i am a little disappointed that he didn't i gotcha and i think i told you i have a son who's a lawyer he speaks chinese he's been to china three times what better positioning could i have sure. but you know it's a different culture and it's all bribes so i would have to pay fifty thousand in bribes to maybe get nothing yeah you move yeah. on you or, move on, next or move on to the next book, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah no kidding. No kidding. So um, now, one thing I noticed, it's interesting, like, how do you decide what to write a book on? Because when I look at your catalog, it looks to me to be passion projects. Like, yeah. <laughs> That is a good way of putting it, Robin. I love that. I love that. Okay, why cats don't bark? Intuition, souls code, and calling. I have a very spiritual flair. Um, but I look at my first brochures in speaking way back in the 60s and 70s. And I noticed I was talking about intuition then. In fact, I've trademarked the term intuitive intelligence, the other IQ. Oh, nice. And so that was in my blood all along. So that one made sense, right? I, I love, that's a good question, Robin. Second one, sex for the soul. As a psychotherapist, I saw so many people so hurt by the betrayal of an affair. Mm -hmm. So sex for the soul is sexuality as a path to spirituality. And if you're into casual sex, you may not agree with me. And, and but at least if you agree to it, it's okay. But if you betray someone, the mm -hmm. hurt and the pain I saw as a psychotherapist, it's be honest. You know what? If you want another lady, man, why don't you get a divorce and move on? And so, and and you know what? I would have dedicated it to Princess Diana. It was at the printers right when she came out on 60 Minutes oh, wow. with her story of the pain and three were kind of crowded in the marriage and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And I only had to pay twenty nine dollars. I, I wish I had done it. It was really Princess Diana's story. So that was the passion there. Winning how winners think what champions do as a motivational speaker. I really wanted the answer to what makes the kid on the other side of the tracks become president or whatever, you know. And so I interviewed all of these people. And so the passion was because I wanted the answer to that. And, and you know what, there's a lesson there too for marketing. If you're writing a book and you engage other people. So I interviewed Nito Cobain at High Point. He took it from an unknown school to sometimes called the Ivy League School of the Southeast. Okay. So some of them were speaker friends. Some were like Jack Canfield, um, Rosa Parks. I almost had. What? Rosa Parks. She was going to let, I was going to fly to Michigan. And her health went down and I oh. felt selfish pushing her because, you know, when you're dying well, you yeah. and it yeah. just felt selfish, but I do have her story in there. Mm -hmm. So, and Oprah, I mean, you know, the whole thing about your soul's code and calling in life is between the ages of three and nine people have a flash of what they're meant to do in life, what their soul's called and calling is. And this is what he left out. Oprah looked at the TV when she was five years old and said, I can do that. Huh. And by you can, every person, a uh, Carol Burnett, everybody had a flash of greatness. You listen, they rock bands. You can listen to anybody. They had a flash of their greatness between three and nine. And so I was looking for that in winning. So winning became a testimonial book for Why Cats Don't Bark. But here's what your readers or listeners need to know. So now if I got people like Jack Canfield in the book, guess what? They help market it. Sure. So engage them so that they have a personal motivation to put it on their website. Because mm -hmm. you always want to take shortcuts. We only have so much time and energy. So, <laughs> you know, we have to do it that way. Now, I'm going to skip a couple books and tell you how it led to my biggest passion, which is I Believe I Can Fly. It's not just a book for children. 
It's a complete system of thinking. It's neuropsychology in action. It wires kids for health, happiness, and success at the right age. As a therapist, I'm rewiring people all the time, reprogramming their mind, right? Getting rid of the old mental software. And I thought, what if we wire kids right? So this is how you might find a pattern as an author. I, I write these two books where they all have a flash of greatness. And then I'm thinking, what about the millions of kids that live and die and never sing their song because they never knew what their, they didn't know what the music was. And, and so I created a kids program and the TEDx talk is brain fitness for kids cloning the DNA of Einstein. I created that as a marketing tool because what that program does is it plants seeds of greatness. It gives kids that flash of greatness that Oprah and every person that climbed every, a higher mountain has had. Mm. It plants it in every child who has that program. Now, is that cool or what? It is so cool. I mean, I'm so fascinated by this idea of this flash of greatness. And I'm thinking, um, I would imagine that a lot of people, do you think everyone has it and just a lot of people forget they had it? Um, and as a therapist, I, I go back to that in my therapy sessions a lot and and um and do therapy out and zoom calls as well that's a little plug in case you didn't notice it <laughs> i am so subtle <laughs> i am so subtle go for it honey some people don't have the flash They're, but that doesn't mean they don't have the code that mm -hmm. doesn't mean that it's not there it just it's like a light bulb that hasn't been turned on and so that's what i try to do in the program so I think with a good therapist, by questions, you know, I'll tell you, like uh, children who are asked more often, what do you want to be when you grow up, are more successful. Just by the question, because what it's doing is turning on that light bulb. Exactly. And so I just thought if kids are in an environment, parents might be on drugs. If they're playing, and the magic is in the audio. In fact, one four-year-old child played one five-minute track one time. And the mother said there was a dramatic change in his confidence. And because he was a real shy kid. But anyway, um, it's just a matter of illuminating it. Everybody has it. And some are broad. You know, I, I think I have a more global one. I try to reach people, whether it's speaking the book, whatever. And then other people, it might be making the best poppy seed lemon cake right and that's okay <laughs> you know you read obituaries and and i just kind of smile but i'm not it's not smug yeah. it's just you know she made the best lemon i'm from wisconsin everything's poppy seed, lemon <laughs> poppy seed cake. and and you know um and knit the best sweater and and for me that that's just not who i am so as as long as we're in alignment and in sync Mm -hmm. then it's great. Then that is our greatness. And I feel like you really have walked that talk with your choices as an author, right? Because we, mm -hmm. we go back to this idea of these passion projects. I mean, it, it yeah. you know, it's interesting because the more I talk with you, I can see the through line, you know, but if you just looked at the list on its own, it might not be so obvious. Right. Do you think that, um, that your evolution of, you know, from going from one book to the next, like how is that, how does that reflect changes in you in your own life? How has writing those books changed who I am? Well, no, how does how do your choices about which books you've decided to write mirror <sighs> your own evolution in your own life? Oh. Oh, that's a very good question. Yeah, I, you know, and there was a different purpose in each one. Like some were more personal growth oriented. Yeah. Forget selling. I do sales training. That was, I was like, oh, I should have a business book. And that's what you have to decide. Do you want your book to be a brochure? Do you want it to be a handout that you include in, you know, some of the training that you're doing? Do you want it to be a gift to your kids? I mean, you, and, and you just have to really decide, do you want to make money on it? Do you want to be like Kawasaki and just have a bestseller and make a lot of money from the book? Or do you want it to lead to speaking engagements? 
but how does it reflect? You know, and some of it was just emoting, like what most builders won't tell you. I just was fed up with the builders and how they cheat people and stuff. So I've got these interviews and I'm like, I'm gonna write this book so other people don't get screwed over like I did. And, and so some were a little bit, you know, off. And then bullying. Yeah, um, yeah what yeah. was that about? Yeah, you know, the bullying, I guess as a therapist, I'm seeing people that have been bullied. And as a speaker, you know, I knew it was a hot topic. And, and so I really wanted to make a difference. And it's really a handbook. So that one, you could read that. And it's about the bully, the person who is bullied, uh, the bystander. Uh, there's role playing, how you can do that as a teacher, what you should do as a parent. So I think that's the other thing. How are you going to stage your book? Do you want it to be more a resource, which forget selling is, bullying can be? Or do you want it to be one that is to promote self-growth, awareness, enlightenment, or whatever? Mm -hmm. So I think you have to kind of start with the end goal mm -hmm. in mind. Yes. And, and so, yeah, it is where, you know what? It's whatever is an issue for me at the time, I guess. Mm -hmm. It really is. But you know what my next book is? And I love the title. I got to do one more, but oh, I got so much stuff to get rid of. Oh, <laughs> such a pack wrap. <laughs> I just, but you know what it is? It's um, trust. Listen to this. Don't you guys take it. I'll sue you. <laughs> you better hurry up and write it. <laughs> I get that. You'll have to help me, Robin. Trust no one love everyone it's a double entendre Ooh, it's another that. one like why cats don't bark so that here again the title's been with me for years and i'm gonna mm -hmm. try to get my life organized enough where i can go to the beach one more time and get that written but it's the ups and downs of my life and it's it's mm -hmm. pretty um you know it's i i have allowed people to take advantage of me because my achilles is i trust I, mm. I, I have a natural instinct to help people and to trust to a fault. Mm -hmm. And so I could be bitter, but I don't think I sound bitter. I'm not. And, uh, but you got to learn that lesson, don't you? Oh, yeah. And so that's where you have to, maybe I have to be more discerning, mm -hmm. but the love everyone is to still have a happy heart. So you can be creative and you don't tie up energy in those negative forces. Does that make sense? Oh, totally. Absolutely. That's yeah. a great one. Now, you know what? I want to say one more thing. This is so much fun, Robin. Aren't we oh, having a blast? I so much fun. Yes. I know. This is tea. This is honestly tea. This is not fun. <laughs> but you know what? I, I'm turning 77 this month. And fortunately, I've been gifted with good health, I think. And, and more energy than the average 20 year old. So I've got, I had a bad accident a year and a half ago and I thought, and I shouldn't even be here, but, but I am. And so I thought, you know, God isn't done with me yet. And that's when it's like, okay, I got to focus on getting the kids program out there and so forth. But, you know, I think we really have to look at, um, you know, and I forgot where I was going to go with this. Um, it's on marketing. Like, oh, shortcuts. Mm -hmm. At this point in my life, I just realized I'm not 32. If I'm going to make all this happen and have an impact, I have to look at shortcuts. So I don't care what age you're at. Looking at shortcuts is a matter of being more efficient. And on a call, I just hired a marketing person. And, and, and she's getting its work partner. I like that because she's got skin in the game. She's going to move here. I'm going to move her in my, my guest bedroom. We're going to rock. And so what I'm saying is if you don't get around to doing things on that to-do list, delegate it. Oh my partner gosh. with some, right, partner with Robin. Do something to just, because I told her, I will be fair. We haven't even discussed what percent she's going to get, but I think we're both so dang fair. I'm not worried about it. My goal is to get it out there. Mm -hmm. I can't take the stupid money with me anyhow. You know what I mean? Yeah. Not that yeah. I don't want I still have to pay yeah. my bills. But, but, but look yeah. at what, if that's not your core genius and you're not getting it done, who she's, I mean, she's extremely organized. 
I am internally, but if you saw the rest of this room, oh my God, I can't even walk through it. <laughs> and, and so this is good. The other shortcut is, you know, like I said, if you have people in your book that are going to be motivated to, to market it. And then there's kind of like joint ventures. Who has something like you where you can compliment them? Let me give you an example. I'm very versed on 50 years of working with hypnosis, the subconscious mind. Neuroscience is now in. That's just science proving what I've been doing for 50 years. So a speaker friend of mine, Lenora Billings, um, uh, and she's an, uh, I don't know if she's African-American, but she's black. And, and she's got the diversity market, but with unconscious biases, oh my God, she's got that. So I just wrote to her and I said, you know what? I can add to your program because I have 50 years of experience with the unconscious mind and what I'm, you know what I mean? So I'm telling your listeners, think about other people where you're not going to compete, but you will embellish right. and compliment and together. Yeah. That's and they a can great cross, combination that is. That's fantastic. Yeah, cross promote. Your website has their book and, mm -hmm. and you all bundle it and you'll sell more. Just get the job done. Yeah. And you know what I haven't done yet, Robin, is, you know, the audio books. There's just so many hours in the day and we have to, but I think they can be a good idea because so many people, now they're not commuting, but if commuting yeah. comes back, <laughs> yeah. But when they were commuting and sitting in traffic, then, I mean, people were doing audio books more than, than reading. Oh yeah. Audio books is the, the fastest growing segment in the industry right now. And it still, still is, huh? Is it still? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. It is, but and then you know, I think endorsements. You know, I think people. I, I I love David Ricklin, and that's how I met the gal from South Africa. He has selfgrowth.com. I sure yeah, you know, I know him. David. Yeah, he's great. And he said, you know, start with getting endorsements, but you know, you know, you're not going to get Tony Robbins. You're going to get this, and I'm like, what? What a limiting belief. Tony Robbins took me over the hot coals personally 30 years ago. <laughs> I was a talk, I had a talk show on ABC. I interviewed him. He loved me. He invited me to do a tour with him in China. I don't think that way. I called LeBron James. LeBron James, he's got a school. I'm like, okay, did they call did LeBron call me back? No. Did someone on his team call me back? Yes. Have you heard of Dolly Parton? Called her. The CEO or somebody called me back, said, you know, we're so focused on her, you know, library and whatever she's doing. Okay. I don't look at it as no, it's just not yet. Right. But, but I don't think like, oh no, you're not going to get, you're not going to no. get them. Oh right. my God. <laughs> Go for it. I, you know what? I, I mean, my mother's best advice was ask. They can always say no. Exactly. I was just yes. talking about this with, it was actually my last podcast interview before you, we were talking about how few people ask. And, and go big, go both ways, do some high ones in the middle, get some. Well, yeah. But I mean, if you don't ask, you won't get it. You can guarantee that. Exactly. And, you know, I think the other good thing about once you have your book written now, I have Kristen Miller is her name. And, and so I, I can send her a copy of winning and she can make a million and one blogs from it. You can hire someone on five, Fiverr, um, yeah, yeah. you can uh, Upwork or whatever uh, for 75 cents an hour or whatever, but pay them more than that. Right. And, <laughs> I don't like child labor, but you know, they can, that might be you know, all there you know that, I don't know if you ever heard of that. Um, there's this meme or something but it says and it, it's like the word karma and it's, yeah. it's written on a card that has like blue and gold stripe and then it's and the subtitle is it's everywhere you're going to be yes <laughs> I love it. I love it. but um yeah no so once you've got your book articles you can put out you can have somebody if you don't have time Somebody can just take a chapter, make an article, make a blog. Oh, you could probably make four or five blogs out of a chapter. I oh, could. yeah, exactly. And so, and then, you know, the other thing I'm going to do tomorrow, I'm going to hit it hard. Got it all. But I'm going to start doing videos for my kids program. Two things. I'm going to do, um, you know, parenting tips like, hey, if your kid is having a temper tantrum, try this. And parents are... Oh my God, they're so hungry for what do I do now? And especially, especially with now. Yes. 
So this is long and coming. This is like the book. I've been planning to do these videos for about 10 years, but I'm doing it. Tomorrow it's happening. And that's true. Everybody's got to put it down like a dentist appointment. Put yeah. it down tomorrow, 10 o'clock, just like I saw you at three today. And then you just do it. And then I'm going to do some with kids. Hey, kids, did someone call you a bad name? And how does that make you feel? And then you do this. So you remember Mr. Rogers? I'm going to be the Mrs. Rogers. Oh, okay. Yeah. And, you know, I even pitched a Shark Tank. Problem was they loved it. No, I, 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 was, I was getting filtered. I, I, didn't, I wasn't on TV the step before. Okay. He loved it. But I didn't have the sales. Kristen is going to get the sales up. And you will see me on Shark Tank. Okay. Now, one more shortcut, honey. And not everybody's going to do this because not everybody's as crazy as I am. But I can't emphasize, look for shortcuts. Yeah. So guess what I did? And I'm so blessed tired because I was up till one in the morning. Guess what I was doing, Robin? What were you doing, Edie? I had The Bachelor on last night. I don't just sit and eat popcorn, but I have it on, okay? And it said, to apply for the Senior Bachelorette. You applied? I have a gut feeling I'm going to oh get it. God, I love that. Do you love this? I love it. Oh, my God. Oh, Talk I hope you get it. Instant PR. <laughs> but don't let them see this. No, I want a man. I'm just, you know, I'm there for the right intention. But there can be spinoffs, right? Oh, my God. <laughs> Can you believe this? Talk I'm gonna, about, uh, what are they, a leveraged strategy. Oh, my God. You're going to get the man and the publicity and the exactly. shark tank. Yeah. It's, it's, we don't see <laughs> right from the or. bachelorette to the shark tank. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and you know what? And this is, you know, okay, one more thing. I keep saying one more. I sound like my dad. He always had one more story. But, <laughs> you know. I think we just have to recognize opportunity. I truly believe, and I don't want to get too spiritual here, but God, the universe, whatever you're comfortable with, I truly believe that we stumble on things all the time and we we walk right over it or we trip on it. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it's, you know, it's cosmic fishing. It's God's telephone telling you to pick up the call, answer it. Is this not true? Oh, yeah. And so I do believe, you know, Kristen coming into my life, it's unbelievable. Because I wasn't even going on the call that day and she just liked my energy. And, and we clicked and now, you know, as soon as COVID will let her out of South Africa and in here, um, it's going to happen. And then to be on the bachelor, the senior bachelor, <laughs> this could never happen. I got five cats. I've got three vacation rentals in my house. I can't be away more than a couple days. Kristen, I trust. Yeah. She will have a lovely place here on the lake. She doesn't have to pay me a dime, honey. She better feed my cats. <laughs> and, but she can run it all while I go out and drink wine and meet men. <laughs> But, you know, so and the point I am making is life is a feast and more, most poor fools are starving. Mm -hmm. Opportunity. Recognize it. And then move on it. Right. And That's move on it. I see with you is there's no grass growing under your toes. Yeah. No, that's the bottom line. <laughs> move on it. And just. So I really do believe that, um, you know, and that's really what my first book was about, but, but he took it out. <laughs> he took it out. But buy the revised copy, it'll all be there, Robin. Okay, so are great. there any other questions? Um, you know, and I think like I, I get interviewed like with you, well, we're just having such a blast. I've done a lot of podcasts and I can't say I've ever gotten the return I've liked, but it might be my fault. And I think this might be true with a lot of authors. I'm a teacher at heart. Mm -hmm. And so I'm so excited about, you know, getting the message, recognize the opportunity that you really have to look at the end goal. And, and so if it is for, to buy the book or whatever, well, I did slip in that one plug. I did pretty well today. Um, but, but know the, the end goal. If it's to convert, if it's to get people to buy your book or whatever it might be, 
then, then, you know, have a map in your mind of how you're going to get there. Otherwise, you know, you might entertain a lot of people, you might educate them, but you may not be able to pay for your electric bill. <laughs> You'll have skinny kids. <laughs> right. Well, I would say too, if like, I think that book sales can be um, a nice supplement. Yeah. But, um, you know, I think that to really fully receive the uh, affluence, the abundance that's possible in becoming an author, it's mm -hmm. really like you were talking about, you want to look at that bigger vision of like, exactly. what do you want people to do with you once they have your book? Right. You know, what's right. the next step? What's the course? Like you've, yes. you've, you've developed these programs. What's the program? What's the course? Right. Because that um, can, yep. you know, can make it so that really yep. what you need to do is get books in people's hands um, so that they know you exist. It's you know, just, and you so much more money on, on what you can do with the book versus just the book sales. You know, and, and I'll say a little bit about PR. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you just have to be wise about it. I mm -hmm. spent a ton of money on PR when the first book came out and it is the one that has sold the most. But, um, but I did a lot of PR that wasn't relevant. You know, I was in Cosmopolitan USA Today. So I, it looks good, but it didn't sell one single book because I was getting PR and getting interviewed. I mean, it was a full-time job, but it didn't pay for one book. So have I been on all the good stuff? Does it look good? Yeah. Does it, you know, feed my cats? No. Yeah. It, yeah. PR doesn't necessarily convert to book sales. I yes. I think it's important that, that people understand that. And, and, but what it does do is it does ramp up visibility, right? And it helps more people know about you. And that can, as, as a side effect, lead to book sales. Right. And I think, you know, things have changed. I mean, that was 20 years ago that I wrote the first one. And social media, creating the buzz, it is so different now. And that's what Kristen is doing for me, you know, really creating a buzz on LinkedIn and Facebook and Instagram and know your audience. I mean, if I'm appealing to mommies, then we're going to do more on Facebook. If I'm going to do corporate training, then LinkedIn. So know where you want to create that buzz on, on social media. And two other things, because I had this at the top of the list, but we just had so much fun, <laughs> um, is, you know, the difference of soft and hard cover. And um, I've got all my hard covers left. And so even, and I don't think people were buying the soft cover more because it was cheaper, but they can throw it in their purse. My it's age group. It's easy to yeah. carry. No, it's my easy. age group, it wasn't a book unless it was hard covered it had right, to right. <laughs> on the shelf. that is not how people think today and my other mistake was you know I ordered 10,000 of each one and I was speaking a lot back then when I wrote my books I lost my momentum speaking mm -hmm. so you may want to watch the balance if you're mm -hmm. it, it was a mistake to tell you the truth and and you know well now there aren't even live audiences so now I've got to start doing webinars but right. Um, so I did 10,000 of each and you just got to know some are going to sell better. Now, back of the room sales were great. I could sell 4,000 after a speaking engagement, but I'm not speaking. So now my garage is full. So in hindsight, what I would recommend is yet yeah, don't order 10,000. Don't do it. Do the thing with Amazon where they print on demand, all of that, you know, all the options. Yeah, and say, yeah, don't do it unless you are. 100% committed exactly to every single one and that means selling books on lots of days when you don't feel like selling books exactly <laughs> well you know like even Wayne Dyer do you remember do, yeah sure. do you remember him yeah. yeah comfort zones all of that stuff well yeah you know when he died I loved him but do you know how he did it he would go to bookstores and say, hey, do you have the sky's the limit or whatever? And, and they would say no. And he'd say, well, it's by Wayne Dyer. And then 10 minutes later, his wife would go in <laughs> and say, I'm a salesperson. We have these books. One is Wayne Dyer's. 
And that is how, so sometimes you got to be a little sneaky. Yeah. I, it's yeah. not being unethical. It's just being creative. It's called creative marketing. <laughs> <laughs> Or guerrilla marketing. That's yeah, cool. he's my friend. One. Yeah, Ray Orville, <laughs> Orville Ray Wilson, yeah. Oh, and Orville and, Ray, yeah, that's right, guerrilla style. And I got it sitting right here because it got wet in the basement, so I got fans on Orville's book. <laughs> it's funny you're bringing it up. The other thing you might think about is I've done some, like, I spoke for NAFA, National Insurance Association Insurance Financial Advisors. Guy brings me in and then he bought a thousand copies or something. So he'd have one for all of his team members. You got to realize it's a lot easier to sell, um, you know, a thousand copies to one client. And I wanted winning to go to Amway. Sometimes it's hard to get in uh, what most builders won't tell you. I was sure that Lowe's and Home Depot, I thought it was a home run. And they should have it. But try to get through the big boxes. You know, I think Lowe's only works with Better Homes and Garden. They have their own publishing. Mm -hmm. So ahead of time, if you think you're going to do a volume with something like the big box, Lowe's or Home Depot, know ahead of time what the process is. Uh -huh. Fortunately, I didn't do 10,000 of those. And um, yeah, so that that would be another another thing to do. Yeah, I think that you've, you've, you've learned some some of these lessons, some of these hard knocks lessons that so many self-publishers go through. And I, I want to take a moment to thank you, Edie, for being so transparent and, and vulnerable and sharing these because this the information that you've provided today, if people are really listening to what's underneath everything you're saying, it's that there's a lot of things that mm -hmm. you have to take into account. And you know, yeah, when you traditionally publish, there are also other things you have to take into account to protect yourself, but you have given us a, you know, 20 year course yeah. on, you know, 20 year uh, in the making PhD. Learn from right my now. mistakes, huh? Right. They were, on, some of them were expensive. Exactly. On some of the things that can happen as a self-publisher, um, that to watch out for and to plan ahead for and to think through ahead of time um, right. because you know you can you can end up suffering when you just kind of if you wing it or if you just sort of hope it works out or if you think well if i do this then this this outcome will happen automatically when that's not true and it can be very difficult because discouraging times, discouraging yeah it can be discouraging but a lot of times there's people around you and unfortunately this is rampant in the self-publishing realm where there's people around you telling you that it's going to work out telling you that you're going to get these things if you just spend this money and unfortunately and we're not going to name names or anything but yeah. unfortunately this often isn't true and um so you've really given a tremendous gift to our listeners and especially the ones who are working in the self-publishing space. So I, I thank you. Uh, Can I add two more points? Please. I did, I did a bunch of anthologies, like a dozen before I, it was an easy way to say I'm writing. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if that was wise. I paid six times more for the book because there was a middle person. And you know what, once you publish your own, they could care less if you're with Zig Ziglar or Tony Rock. They could care less. They want you. So those are really hard for me to sell. And I paid six times more. Uh -huh. But I'll tell you one story. In one of the anthologies where we just had quotes, somebody wanted a speaking gig with TJ Maxx. She left the book there, but they liked my quotes more. <laughs> I got my highest speaking gig with TJ Maxx because somebody else left an anthology there. So you never know. And then the last point I want to make is I think the one good thing about my books, well, I think it's more than one, but they're all evergreen. Yes. Intuition. There's nothing old about that. Yeah. Uh, sex for the soul. Sex ain't going anywhere soon. No, not out of style. No. Yeah. And <laughs> I don't selling, see bullying. There's very little I would change. I would add. Yeah. But there is almost a children's book. So uh, the other thing I would say is you may want to think like M. Scott Peck's, you know, um, 
what was his again? The Less Traveled. Yes, it was just on that. He, he had it as a bestseller for like 10, 11 years. Oh, yeah. You know, it's evergreen. Mm -hmm. And so that's the other thing. You don't want to be like Schwarzkopf was, you know, the Desert Storm. Right, right. Big seller for, for sure. a month. Yeah. Half the people watching the call probably haven't even remembered Desert Storm. So I would encourage people to think evergreen. But Very Robin, good. this has been that delightful. You have to come down to the lake and visit me. We'll have a retreat here. We'll have an author's retreat. Oh, how fun. An author's retreat at the lake. I've got three units and we can house about a dozen people. You all come down. All right. As soon as we can take those masks off, girl, we're there. Yeah. <laughs> I would love it. I would love it. Edie, thank you again for your generosity and sharing today. Take care. We'll be in touch. Definitely. Uh -huh. Bye, everyone. Thank you for tuning in to another amazing episode of The Author's Corner. You're one step closer to writing the world-changing book you've dreamed about for years. To access today's show notes and other helpful resources, simply visit our website at theauthorscorner.com. A positive review would be appreciated. Until next time.